Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on challenges in data processing. My name is Kristen Lutz, and I am a technical consultant at Surfsera, working with our data processing and custom cloud solutions. Today, I am joined in the studio with Loka Boonstra. Thank you for joining us. Right. So data processing has been on the forefront of innovation for decades, and today is more relevant than ever. Data is being collected at all times from all around us. Companies and institutions are constantly shifting to make better use of this data. And today we are going to be hearing from two research projects who are hoping to make use of this data to draw new insights about the world around us. Our first speaker today will be Otto Hasekamp. Sorry. Otto Hasekamp is a senior scientist at SRON and a principal investigator of the SPEX-1 project. SPEX-1 is an instrument that will be launched on NASA's upcoming PACE mission. Putting the A in PACE, uh, SPEX-1 will be used to collect aerosol information from our atmosphere. Uh, and SURF is lucky enough to be one of the compute sites that SPEX-1 is using. So without further ado, joining us remotely, here is Otto. Otto, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Kristen. No problem. I will indeed talk about uh, SPEX-1 and in specifically about uh, the relevance of SPEX-1 for climate research. And uh, I will explain a bit the SPEX-1 data processing. Um, is my presentation up? Yes, there it is. There we go. Okay, thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Otto. So, um, what SPEX-1 will measure uh, are aerosols, which are small particles uh, in the air. Um, they're also called particulate matter, PM, and these aerosols can have different origins. For example, uh, they can come from urban pollution that results in the haze over LA in this photo or from fires that produce smoke where the smoke contains many, many aerosols. And different types of aerosols vary a lot in their size, in their shape and their composition, as you can see from the microscopic photograph on the left. And this model animation that you see gives an impression about the global distribution of aerosols. So dominant aerosol types are dust and smoke, for example, indicated in red and brown in this figure. Uh, you can see a lot of dust and smoke coming from Africa, traveling all the way to South America. Uh, another important aerosol type is sulfate, indicated in white here. You mainly see it over industrial areas in Asia, Europe, North America. And another important aerosol type is sea salt. Uh, wind blown over the open ocean. You clearly see it over the southern uh, and northern latitudes. So, why are these aerosols so important to measure? <laughs> well, overall, aerosols cool the earth and counteract global warming by greenhouse gases, but we don't know by how much. Aerosols cool the earth uh, because they reflect back sunlight into space, and in this way they also dimming of the solar light. And this means there is less energy available to warm the earth. The most striking example of this effect is the eruption of the Pinatubo volcano in the Philippines in 1990, which ejected a lot of sulfur aerosols high into the atmosphere. After this eruption, the global temperature dropped by almost one degree. That's really a lot. Um, and another reason why aerosols cool the earth is that cloud droplets form on these aerosol particles. And here, more aerosols means we have more clouds and brighter clouds. And this can be nicely seen from the photograph of ship lanes, where you see clouds appear above the ship lanes, which are formed on the aerosol particles emitted from the chimneys of the chips. So overall, aerosols cool the atmosphere and the Earth, but the magnitude is very uncertain. Because if we look into more detail, we see that this amount of cooling depends a lot on the type of aerosols. Uh, some aerosols even cause warming, uh, and some aerosols have much more effects on clouds than others. 
And this uncertainty on the amount of aerosol cooling results in a very large uncertainty in climate predictions. And we hope to learn much more about these aerosols with the upcoming NASA space mission to be launched in 2023. The space mission will carry three instruments, the ocean color instruments, that gives uh, us a better understanding of the role of oceans in climate change, and then the two aerosol cloud instruments, ARP2, it provides accurate cloud instruments, and the Dutch SPEX1 instrument, it will provide accurate aerosol measurements. And SPEX1 will measure the light reflected by the Earth's atmosphere and surface under five viewing angles, as you can see in this slide. And by flying over a certain location, SPEX1 can observe these locations under all these five viewing angles. But actually, the most important aspect of SPEX1 is that it performs very accurate polarization measurements, the polarization of light. Light can be seen as a wave that oscillates in all directions. And if we measure polarization of light, we only measure light that oscillates in one direction. The same principle is used, for example, in your polarized sunglasses. Looking through these sunglasses, the light pollution is being filtered out, and the details of what you're looking at is much more pronounced. And two examples are shown in the photos at the top of this slide. Similar to these examples, SPEX1 will see the detail of the aerosol, like its size and the composition, by looking at the polarization of light reflected by these aerosols. In the photo on the lower right, taken by a polarized camera, you very clearly see the aerosols in the sky, much better than in the normal photo on the left. So, this SPEX1 instrument, uh, many people worked on it uh, already for a long time. The development started more than 10 years ago. First, the prototype version was built, which was analyzed in the lab. Then a ground-based measurement uh, was built to perform aerosol measurements by looking upward to the sky. The next step was airborne measurements from the NASA ER2 high altitude aircraft. And now finally we have built a SPEX-1 instrument for the NASA space mission. It has actually been shipped two weeks ago to NASA and it will be launched in 2023. And obviously, uh, data processing is an essential step for SPEX1 to produce the data that is relevant for climate research. The data processing chain starts at level one data, which are the raw detector counts. Then you have level one B data that are calibrated measurements of intensity and polarization for each viewing angle individually. Well, in the level one C data, all viewing angles have been resampled on the same spatial grid. And then finally, the level two data are the aerosol and cloud properties that are needed for understanding the effect of aerosols on climate change. So first some words on the level one processing. Uh, the figure on the left shows a raw detector image of SPEX1, so which could be seen as level one A data. And you can see each viewing angle provides measurements for two polarization directions. So you see in total 10 measurements. And what the level one processor does, it uses on-ground calibration measurements to translate the detector image in a spectrum of intensity and degree of polarization as a function of wavelength for each viewing angle. An example is seen on the right. And then we go to the level two processor. Uh, and the level two processor translates these spectra into the aerosol and cloud properties. And in order to do so, we need a forward model. Uh, and this forward model models the transport of radiation through the atmosphere, including scattering and absorption by aerosols, reflection on the surface, etc. Um, and actually running this forward model is the most time consuming step in the whole data processing chain. And we need it multiple times. Actually, to get the aerosol and cloud properties, we need to invert the forward model. This is an iterative process, uh, and we need to do so to finally get the desired aerosol and cloud properties.
In the next slide, you can see an example of the SPEX1 data coverage for one day. Um, in total, we have about 1 million measurements per day, but we will only perform aerosol retrievals for, for the cloud-free measurements, which is about 20% of the data. Uh, well, given that the processing of one measurement takes five to seven seconds, it is clear that parallel processing uh, with a lot of processing for, force is required. And even more so because we need to reprocess uh, the data uh, quite some times. And that's why we need SurfSara. Um, so for Spex1, there will be two scientific process there will be two processing lines. One is a scientific processing line at SurfSara, and there will be an operational processing line at NASA. So when a mission starts, in the first two months of the mission, and uh, it's called the commissioning phase, we need to do a lot of uh, testing of different processing options. Uh, and in this way, we will define the best initial settings to start the operational processing at NASA. Then we will continue to improve our processing algorithms uh, and, and validate the results, uh, do reprocessings, and then we provide the improved data sets to expert users. And then approximately once per year, we collect all our improvements in the algorithms and then we update the operational processor at NASA. And at a certain point, uh, I expect after three years, uh, the, the processing algorithms are sort of finalized. And from that point, uh, NASA can fully take over the SPEX1 data processing. So, uh, SurfSara is really essential for the SPEX1 data processing. Um, and it's also really important that we have SurfSara in addition to the processing at NASA. Uh, because uh, it, all the relevant scientists and programmers uh, from the SPEX1 team have direct and flexible access to the uh, processing uh, infrastructure, so we can quickly test and improve our algorithms. We cannot do that at NASA. And when we have an improved version of our software, we can then start processing with this improved algorithm right away. At NASA, that takes months, if not more. Um, and also, we can do many, many uh, reprocessings, which are important to improve our algorithms, but also to have a complete data set with the best version of our algorithm. So I'm really happy, and not only me, the whole SPEC1 team is very happy that we have SurfSara. It plays an essential role in our processing. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Otto. Thank you for joining us. I'm very surprised to hear that sea salt is considered an atmospheric aerosol. That's, that's so cool. Uh, now, I think we have some time for some questions from our audience. Uh, let's see what we have. All right. First question comes from Mark Van de Sand. How are the data transfers being managed across NASA and SURF? Uh, we haven't sorted that uh, completely out, but the, uh, the idea is NASA will put the data at the, at the place that are openly accessible. So we can probably we have a script running at SURF, downloading automatically these data from NASA, probably through FTP. Mm -hmm. Probably through an FTP server. That's great. Thank you. Let's see. Anything else? All right, great. Thank you, Otto. Uh, our next speaker today will be Lolka Boonstra. Great. Uh, Lolka is an ICT expert working at TU Delft. Some of his areas of expertise include networking, HPC, quantum internet, ICT governance, and data science. His project is working with SURF to deploy modern data management platforms into the cloud in order to help reduce technical barriers between researchers and their ICT. So here's Lolka. Lunk, Thank you, Kirsten, for your uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, I will be talking about uh, a data platform we have been envisioning for a long time, for about three to four years already, uh, for um, researchers to access uh, all types of data. 
And um, so this is not really a research project, but this is uh, a project to help researchers uh, to do some research with, especially campus data. Um, so uh, I will give uh, what's on the agenda for, uh, for my speak. Um, there's a small intro uh, which I will give and, uh, on the TU Delft. Then we, I will talk about how it all came about, uh, why we started it. Uh, we have <coughs> at the TU Delft uh, a field lab called the Green Village that has been used for a pilot uh, uh, for, uh, for this project. And I will also talk about some non-technical stuffies and then finalize at the end where we are standing now uh, after piloting and what we have done together with SURF on the surfaces. So, uh, a brief thing about the TU Delft. Uh, you can see here the beautiful campus. Uh, we, uh, the TU Delft consists of eight faculties. We have 10 departments uh, in the corporate office, about 30,000 students and staff, and we are going to build an HPC cluster with 25,000 cores. That's probably one core per student. So that's a little bit on the TU Delft. Now, the thing, uh, yeah, how did, we, how did this all came about? Already uh, years ago, a lot of researchers wanted to have access to the Wi-Fi data, which ICT has because of maintaining a Wi-Fi network on the campus. So and that's, uh, for most researchers, that's beautiful data to do some localization or some traversement of people around the campus. Um, the other thing which happened a few years ago was that the board um, created a strategic plan and one of the things they mentioned out there was that they wanted to be the campus as a living lab, which really, um, yeah, put some things behind this uh, project. Uh, we have been starting to do some workshops with researchers to find out what the best way for such a platform would be. And with this workshop, we also got some people from the Green Village uh, uh, from that field lab, uh, invited them also, because they have a lot of data within their projects, uh, which they wanted to share between the projects. And that, that ended up that we decided to do a pilot uh, for the Green Village. Uh, together with SURF, we hired some SURF consultants and we had a global idea of what that platform should look like. So above you have the different types of sources of data. Here it's still mainly ICT data. You have the short-term storage, and maybe that was not for sure when we started. We also wanted to have some long-term storage. And then underneath you have the different people or researchers who want to have access to that to that uh, data. This is, um, in this way, we wanted to centralize and standardize the, the way researchers could get access to all types of data. Okay, then we come to the pilot phase. Um, this was uh, also on consulting basis with SURF. Uh, we created, uh, we, we let them create, uh, yeah, the platform which uh, was, yeah, the functionality was uh, created during those workshops. So the ICT innovation department of the central ICT department at the TU Delft uh, hired some people from SURF and they created an on-premise hardware and software solution based on Kafka uh, running on a Kubernetes cluster all, all at the Amsterdam environment. Uh, for visualization, uh, Gravana dashboard has been created and the other thing we did because, um, yeah, of all those different sensors uh, which are at the field lab, uh, there was an explicit uh, question for a lot of metadata on those sensors. And also the, the platform created that part. So here is an overview of the Green Village digital platform. At that time, I would say it was the 0.1 solution, uh, which had been created. Of course, there was also a, a, a 1.0 solution. Of course, there was also a 0.91, but 
but this was the one which really went into production for the Green Village, uh, um, running the dashboard which they could use to uh, get people involved with different projects. So uh, you can see here is the Kafka cluster. We, there is uh, a time series database, and uh, there is also the metadata storage and an object storage for some long time storage. Um, meanwhile, this still is not, uh, this was the Green Village pilot. Meanwhile, we still were discussing on how to progress with the data platform for the researchers. Uh, as said, we wanted to have a standardized access to campus data. Uh, we are now talking about two years later after my first th uh, thoughts on the Wi-Fi data and all kinds of other campus data. And you can think about heat, electricity, or access control uh, system data uh, also came to mind and yeah, still being on a standardized way. The producer-consumer uh, distinction on the Kafka platform really helps us think about how to get the responsibilities of the, uh, and the access to the data and who is responsible for, for what uh, pretty clear. I will come to that later. We also had a big discussion on do we want to be on premise or in the cloud? Because uh, one of the deliverables was from the pilot was that we could install it on premise at the TU Delft as well, the whole platform. Uh, we tried this, it worked, but then it was only installed and uh, that was it. And we came also into the discussion with Surf on how to finance things. So now we come to the more, not technical stuff. I was thinking when I started this three years, four years ago, that this was a technical project which I could solve in, would say, half a year. So yeah, as said, we are a little bit three to four years later. But if you start at the end of 2017, it's no wonder that you come into the GDPR discussion. So a lot of legal discussions. We even had a workshop on that. Uh, to see how we could handle the GDPR issues with this. Um, there was another thing which we were not sure about in the Kafka environment. There is no user uh, authorization within the pilot. And that meant the, that we were not sure if that would be clear at the end for this uh, work. And as I said, maintenance uh, is more than installing. We noticed at the TU Delft, but also at SURF, that it's not easy to maintain a Kafka Kubernetes uh, environment on premise. And as said, we were having discussions on the costs of the services and who's going to pay what. And as ICT innovation does not have a long term budget, this was a standstill for a while. But yep, finally, after the pilot, uh, Surf has been progressing to a 2.0 service, and yet um, after the pilot, something happened that was called uh, COVID-19. And as an innovator, we never waste a good crisis. This really helped us to get the financial discussion solved. Uh, researchers wanted to have uh, the data for uh, a COVID task force, and that helped uh, us uh, to get the funding to pay SURF for uh, more consultancy hours and for their services. Uh, and uh, also the platform was mentioned in a quarterly report to the board. So yeah, in essence, no way back. Then we come to what we, together with SURF, have created. And there is, uh, underneath you see the Kafka, uh, a Kafka cluster which runs in the cloud. Uh, so not even on-premise at SURF. Uh, those are all the three services underneath. Those are services SURF takes from the cloud. Then they have created the middle ones. Those are created by SURF as services on-premise. Uh, and the schema registry, which is a Kafka thing, uh, and uh, the, uh, also the visualization part, those are services which you can get from SURF. And above you have the producers and the consumer side. And this is what 
the, yeah, the TU Delft itself is creating. The producers is creating from sources into the Kafka platform and the consumers, it will be mostly done by the researchers themselves. So, uh, as said, producers, we, produ uh, we, we take the data, for example, the Wi-Fi data from our Cisco uh, environment. There's an API for that, and we write that in the, uh, into uh, the Kafka data uh, platform. This means uh, we, uh, and we wanted to have the producers on the responsibility of the ICT department, because that's um, in such a way there's only one uh, department responsible for it, and there's only one access point to get to campus data for the researchers. Um, the first pilot was completely open source. That was all source code has been published on the uh, GitLab. Uh, the, this project, uh, those producers we are currently writing from by the TU Delft is semi-open because it's only at the TU Delft GitLab which you can only access by a TU Delft account. Um, we also, the producers, we also want to use to get the knowledge uh, about data uh, to get that across the whole uh, uh, university. And we need a lot of data managers for that also because the, the programming is not writing it into the Kafka platform. That's done once. There is a good example now but the problem now comes with how does the data look from the original source. Set the Wi-Fi data was on a Cisco API, the documentation was not correct, so you have to look in the data itself. Uh, if I go to the access control system data, that's a plain SQL database with no API. But that's, that will be the hard stuff to find out what's in it and what can be used. The producers also take care of one of the big things of the GDPR, and that's anonymization and pseudonymization. It's to make it easier for researchers to get, to do not, yeah, do not be hassled with uh, the GDPR issues. Um, yeah, uh, for here, uh, I show you the, the sources we currently are uh, going to do. The Wi-Fi data we are busy with, we are discussing with real estate, Campus real estate, that's CRA stands for, on the access control system and gas, heat, and electricity. Of course, we have the projects of the Green Village. Those are already migrated from the pilot to the 2.0 uh, services. And there are a lot of IoT field labs popping up at the moment, and they also want to use the data platform for the data they are producing. And but that's future things. Uh, the consumers. As I said, the distinction between producing and consuming also laid out the legal issues. Most of the consumers which we start with will be research uh, people, so it's based on a research proposal and uh, what we've said now, the data management plan contains a GDPR compliancy, so that will solve the GDPR issues uh, on, the, on the data. And the other consumer we have, of course, is the dashboard of the Green Village. For future, there are uh, also people who want to think about using this whole data uh, of the campus for um, production-wise uh, solutions, like occupation and utilization for education and student affairs, so the occupation and utilization of the um, college rooms. And real estate also wanted to have a dashboard for all the campus data. But this is a little bit tricky because the services are not a 24-7 uh, every day a week and in the weekend uh, service yet. And this is still under discussion uh, with, within SURF. But this, uh, this is how we are currently working. Uh, as said, there is a lot of, uh, we had been discussing on cloud and on promise, on premise. The, the producers of the data are on premise at the TU Delft, because that's where we don't want the data to be on a different site than the 
then the TU Delft itself. We connect, uh, uh, for, for example, the Wi-Fi data. The Wi-Fi data itself really contains privacy data, and if you take the access control system even more, uh, the connection you want to have to, to retrieve the data you want to have on campus, so that there's no possible data leakage there. Uh, then we come to those services serve provides. Yeah, from the TU Delft perspective, serve is already a cloud. It's not on premise, so I call it cloud. Uh, within serve, of course, you could see that there were some on premise services and that there also were uh, cloud services provided. And that's, the, that's what has been happening. Uh, we started with uh, consultancy hours uh, and now ending up with services created by uh, SURF, which everyone can take care of. And of course, yeah, what, how the consumers, uh, where they will reside, uh, that's the responsibility of the one who's consuming. Uh, so if, the, if a researcher wants to write a consumer and puts it on Amazon, that should not be a problem because he has already written it down in its data management plan how they will handle the data. And if that's been agreed upon by all the legal and privacy people, then, then it's okay. Um, yeah, that's for me on the thing, uh, on the, the services we get. Uh, and I'm proud to make the announcement that was that the whole project was not in production yet, but we are going to go live with the Wi-Fi data at the 1st of June. This means that researchers from the TU Delft can get access to the Wi-Fi data by then. All the researchers, not only the COVID task force, which is currently only using the data, but it also means that the underlying services which are used uh, for this platform are also available for, via SURF for all institutes who are within the SURF community. This is not yet on a real service basis, but you can contact the people from SURF if you want to use uh, those services, as mentioned, uh, with, uh, within your own institution. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Loka. Let's see if we have any questions for Loka from our audience. One from Thomas. Uh, would you be considering moving also to the on-premise infrastructure in the cloud in the future? No, as I said, for, for, uh, because of the uh, the connection you have with, the, for example, the Wi-Fi data, it is, uh, it is our Cisco platform uh, which manages the, the Wi-Fi network, uh, that we, um, we don't want to move that into the cloud because then we get more GDPR issues because the data we retrieve uh, from, from Cisco uh, is completely not anonymized and not pseudonymized there are MAC addresses and IP addresses of clients in. So that's certainly not the case uh, in, and not even in the future. Okay, great. Uh, that makes sense. That's why you had to soon anonymize the data. Uh, that makes sense. Um, I'm also very excited to uh, hear about your release. Congratulations on the June 1st release. I'm sure people will be biting at the bit to ask when the public release will be outside of TU Delft. But that's, that's something yeah, we have to think about on the, the campus date of the TU Delft. Uh, probably that also will be done if a researcher comes in with um, a research proposal and a data management plan. They have mm -hmm. to provide it in, into the TU Delft environment and then probably they will get access. Mm -hmm. but yeah, first they'd probably need a request for the metadata. But it's exciting if your campus would also like to track its uh, facility usage information that this platform is now available through the, the SURF consultancy group. That's great. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. That is excellent. Thank you, Loka. 
Now let's uh, go on to talk a little bit uh, about some of the solutions that came up today. So we heard from two very exciting research projects, and during that time, three services came up. We, we briefly touched on SPIDER, which is a data processing platform, our consulting services with Locust Project, and also some custom cloud solutions. So uh, to start with, let's talk about Spider. Uh, Spider is being used by the Specs One project to process its data. Uh, Spider is optimized for collaboration, and it's nice to hear Otto mention that that is how he's using it to have his users have better access, or his collaborators have better access to their their development pipelines. Um, and some of the other features we've built into Spider are. A fast internal network um, and external connectivity for each of our compute nodes with for your external data sets, uh, in addition to a variety of storage features from shared and scalable petabyte storage, highly available file system data, and ex extremely fast local disks, in addition to our powerful compute nodes. We've also built in some customizations with granular and role-based access control, which helped for some of the challenges that you encountered around ICT governance. Uh, we also have uh, interactive and batch processing options, in addition to uh, optimizations for interoperability, workflows, containerizations, uh, visualizations, and of course, the classic data sharing. So uh, the second service that we touched on today was consultancy. This came up with Locos Project. Researchers nowadays are expected to be experts in their field in addition to being experts with ICT. Or if you're an ICT professional, you're not only expected to be an expert on your local ICT, but also the variety cl of cloud options that are out there. So SURF has a variety of consultants that are there to help you with this problem. Um, and they are experts on our systems. So in addition to the code development that Locos Project received, we also have services around optimizing software, onboarding compute facilities, uh, data infrastructures, the variety of network bottlenecks you can encounter, um, in addition to helping with developing data visualizations, high performance machine learning, and of course, large, large data transfers. Uh, the third service that came up today was Cloud Compute. So Re Surf has a Research Cloud, which is a service that allows you to deploy your workstation in our in-house on-premise cloud. Um, but this service is completely self-service. Uh, you have complete autonomy over the workspace that you create. Our custom cloud services at, er at Surf uh, are, they provide additional uh, features. Uh, they're a more controlled environment, uh, and they're a great choice for project like projects like Lolka's. Um, even though Lolka is uh, using a mixed use of different clouds outside of Surf, uh, one thing that's important to keep in mind is whether it's custom cloud solutions, research cloud, or Spider. These all have options to deploy on Surf's in-house Elastic Cloud which is deployed with automated and rapid CI-CD pipelines uh, following modern best practices, but they also have options for deploying on public cloud as well. So uh, these are only a small collection of the many pitfalls or challenges that research projects can encounter, and so we've only touched on some of the solutions that we have at SURF. Um, as different as these projects are from each other, there are equally as many projects different from them. So if you have any questions about your project and how SURF can meet those needs, uh, feel free to reach out to us. And now uh, we'll see if there are any questions from our viewers. Oh, the custom cloud solutions slide one more time from Brian Mullins. Yes, we can. <laughs> Did I go through it too quickly? Actually, that's a question. I'm not sure if we can go back to it. Yes, we can. Just give us a moment. So uh, you, this slide that I showed really only had three points, um, but SURF really has a, a pretty vast variety of experience with private and our in-house cloud. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can go about working with uh, cloud and our consultancy services together, even outside of research cloud which really acts more as a, an infrastructure as a service. So um, 
Nope. Sorry, Brian, we can't show you the slide. Let's go on to the next question. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your time and for tuning in today. This has been Challenges in Data Processing. Uh, thank you, Loka, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you, Otto, if you're still online. And uh, thank you, everyone else. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Bye. I think. <laughs>